everyone, and welcome to Book Break. We are here to talk about books that we discovered on TikTok. TikTok uh, made me read it. Yes, TikTok made me read it. That's a good one. So I am here with one of our newer librarians, Molly, and she has graciously agreed to join me and talk me, kind of got me interested in this challenge. So I signed on to TikTok and found a few books myself, but... Um, how did you get started doing the TikTok books, Molly? Um, probably because of my kids. I have young adult children, and sometime during the pandemic, I was bored, so started watching videos on TikTok. And it um, mainly was dog videos, because I'm a big dog lover, mm -hmm. and that evolved into other things that I'm interested in. And, of course, books are a big part of my life, being a librarian. So started to get all sorts of recommendations from TikTok. Yeah. And um, it's it's actually booming in popularity with not just it started, I think, with young adults, you know, young adult books went way up. But TikTok and Book Talk, which is just a tag on TikTok, has led to 9% increase in just overall books, you know, great sales for people, mm -hmm. new TV shows, so... Yep, anytime you walk into a bookstore, they have a display, um, book talk, things that are popular on uh, TikTok at the time. Right. Yeah, this is from Digital Publishing News. Uh, the hashtag book talk has racked up over 5.8 billion views, and some authors have seen a tenfold increase in book sales for works that are often decades old. Yeah. So they're zombieing these books. Right, they're, they're bringing them back yeah. to life. And uh, who's the big author that really saw that? Colleen Hoover. Right. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we still see people coming in asking for her books. Still, so, it's been a year. Yeah. And you and I don't, either one of us have a Colleen Hoover book today, just to kind no. of prove a point that you can find, you know, it's not just about her books. I think some people think it's just all about her but it's really not right and that's um, one of the points that I wanted to make today I'm not a huge Colleen Hoover fan I did read one of her books because of book talk um, but you can find any type of author genre once you start finding the book talkers who like the same type of books as you do right you like them and you know your feed will become populated with whatever genre you're into whether it be fantasy romance there is a, a book talk area on the TikTok for you yes all right so without further ado i am going to get started with my first one which i think you have read as well mm -hmm. and this one really blew up on all the social media i know which one it is without you even saying yeah it's a newer one it's called fourth wing by rebecca garros and to me this was so entertaining it reminded me a lot of the hunger games with dragons Mm -hmm. <laughs> a little bit of twilight thrown in yes some it, of the it kind of had that dark academia vibe felt very ya but it is a little spicier a little bit more you know the characters are young adults so but as you and i were joking we you have to wait about 300 pages to get to the spice but yes. then you know <laughs> then it's there um but here's the setup. So there's 20-year-old Violet Sorengale, and she is supposed to be a scribe. So she's going to be going to this, you know, big fantasy college. I think her father was a scribe, but her mother is like the grand commandant of the university. And she has decided that Violet is going to be a dragon rider. So... Um, so now Violet is small. Her body has like, was it a brittle bone disease yeah, or something? They didn't really say, but her bones broke a lot and she had numerous health problems. Right. So she's thinking, you know, and her older sister is thinking that she is going to be toast because mm -hmm. it's, for one, there's too many dragon riders and not enough dragons. So there's already going to be people. And if the dragons don't like you, they will incinerate you. <laughs> yeah, it's a very cutthroat dragon academy right kind of yeah like hunger games also, you're not all gonna survive and you right. go into it knowing that yes and there's a lot of um competition even amongst the fellow cadets so uh that was really interesting to me i i like the dragon 
<laughs> I like the dragons a lot. I want more dragons. Yeah. Um, so, and of course, there's a love interest. This is what reminded me of YA a little bit because, you know, you go, she goes in, and of course, her sister tells her, go to our old family friend. And now I can't think of his name, but, you know. The she, old family friend romantic interest. There's always got to be, you know, the neighbor kid next door. Right. And they, then an yeah. exciting, new, yes. Yes. possibly Satan. dangerous yeah, love of interest. Of course. And you yes. know right away <laughs> that she's going to go for the dangerous, you know, kind of mysterious who is supposed to be against her you know he kind could of kill her at any moment yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um and you know i don't want to give too much of the plot away but violet begins to learn that you know the top echelons are hiding a secret or could be so it becomes kind of like a spies dragons you know friends Enemies to lovers. I mean, it, it's kind of got all the tropes in there. It's about 500 pages, mm -hmm. but it read to me so fast. It just really was entertaining. I am not saying this is a masterwork. This is not William Faulkner, people, or, you know, F. Scott Fitzgerald, but it sure was fun. And the second one in the series, I believe, is coming out in November. Yes, in November. And I actually... Um, uh, TikTok came across my feed of the author talking about uh, the second book, which I believe is called The Iron Flame. Mm -hmm. And if you have read the first one, you know, on the edge of the spine, there's really beautiful, like, black pages, not on the spine, but the edges of the pages with dragon silhouettes. And she was explaining in the TikTok video why the second book is not going to have those dragon silhouettes. Um, it's because... She wanted to get the book in all the anxious readers' hands earlier, and if she had that detail put in, it would have been another six months or so. Right, so. and I know that this book far exceeded, like, she had to have multiple printings. I don't know if uh, the second printing or whatever had the beautiful decal dragon mm -hmm. edges or whatever, but yeah, I got one of those copies on hold in the library system, and it was very pretty. Yeah, so. um, I did really enjoy that book more than I thought I was going to. Um, definitely entertaining. I am waiting for the second one. And of course, you can just picture the movies that, you know, they're, oh, they're yeah. going to make a movie or a TV show or something out of it. Yeah, I, I feel that too. It yeah. has Who's the author? Rebecca Yaros. Yaros. Okay. Yeah. It seems like she did quite a few, you know, just regular romance. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how much fantasy she did before this um i'm not sure yeah so i had a moment with a patron they asked for the fourth wing wing mm -hmm. right and i mistakenly thought they were talking about the four winds by Kristen hannah oh <laughs> and so we had this really sort of tumultuous moment and i was like <laughs> i was wrong <laughs> yeah <laughs> get with it yeah. get with it yeah <laughs> get with the time i was foiled by tiktok yet again uh -huh. yeah yeah well, the book that I read, um, this, I can truly say TikTok made me read this book, this author. It is Yours Truly by Abby Jimenez, and she writes romances. I am not a romance person. Mm -hmm. I am way too cynical in real life to enjoy romances. <laughs> if the characters get together at the end, I'm like, eh, that's not going to work out. A couple of years, they're going to get sick of each other. <laughs> If they don't get together, I'm upset because, you know, I grew up on Disney movies. I'm not a total ogre. Right. But I'm just not <laughs> happy with the romance genre at all. I read this book because the author has four dogs. So I started following her dogs on TikTok before I knew she was an author. She has these two dogs. One is a very smart German poodle pointer hunting dog mm -hmm. and named Tess. And the other dog is stuntman Mike, who's this little Yorkie terrier mutt who has ties and his tongue half out of his mouth. <laughs> he has no thoughts in his head. He's just cute and dumb. Yeah. I found her TikToks about her dogs to be very funny, and she's a master marketer, so she would start putting, you know, like, hey, I write these books as well, and she featured her dogs in her books. So I picked up this lady's books 
because of TikTok. But anyways, the one I read is her latest one, Yours Truly. It's actually the second of um, Part of Your World series. Okay. You don't need to read Part of Your World first. You kind of get the love story of, you know, the main character's best friend. But if you read Yours Truly, you'll probably want to go and see what happened. Basically, um, the main character... Dr. Brianna Ortiz is not having a good time. She is about to finalize her divorce. Her husband, she caught her husband cheating a year ago. Um, her younger brother, who she's like a mother to, has um, an autoimmune disease, mm -hmm. and he is in desperate need of a kidney. Um, she thought she was going to become promoted to the chief ER doctor at work but all of a sudden that looks to be maybe not the case because there's a new doctor in town dr jacob maddox uh -oh. and gee what do you think is gonna happen claire oh i have a feeling that she's gonna fall in love with dr jacob oh do you think they're gonna like each other right away though no <laughs> No, there's going to be some bad feelings between them. Um, Dr. Jacob has his own love problems. He moved to this new hospital to get away from his ex, who he was in love with for several years, and now she's marrying his brother. Oh, gosh. Yes. That hurts. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that's why he has shown up at her new hospital. Um, the other thing you need to know about him is he suffers from anxiety and, you know, takes medication for it, therapy, regulates his um, exercise, diet, but he's socially awkward. He's still, of course, extremely handsome because... Oh, he's got to be. Yes. Yeah. And, and did I mention that Dr. Brianna is also very beautiful? Of, yeah. of course. They don't um, have ugly people in these things. No, this is why I normally don't read romances. Yeah. I just can't take it. But... Does this um, one have like a letter writing component yes, somehow? It does. So after they have their bad first few encounters, and of course, Dr. Brianna hates him, he feels bad about it, and one of the ways he deals with his anxiety is by journaling. So he figures he is going to write Brianna a letter. Okay. And he does, and of course, Brianna decides hmm, maybe this guy isn't so bad at all. So there's a lot of um, letter writing back and forth between them, which was very enjoyable to read. And, um, you know, there's she becomes his fake girlfriend to go to the brother's wedding. Oh, wow. You know, that, that type of... Another uh, trope in there. Yes. Enemies to lovers. Yes. Fake lovers. Yeah. yeah yes. Um, the reason why I like this author's books, even though I'm too burned by real-life romance to like <laughs> romance novels, is because she's very funny. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of one-liners, the secondary characters, like the family of... Um, Dr. Jacob, they're, they're just hilarious. Um, that's, that's why I keep reading her, and I still follow her dogs. Well, the interesting thing about that one is I belong to Book of the Month Club. That mm -hmm. one was a pick, and I haven't gotten it, but um, that, like, when you read the book, you can rate it on Book of the Month, mm -hmm. and that one has one of the highest, most loved ratings. So it's got to be, it's got to have some appeal with people other than like typical romance readers. Yeah, she usually includes some sort of, you know, real life, you know, the anxiety mm -hmm. or there's some sort of issue that makes it not be complete fluff. Yeah. Um, that people can resonate with, um, you know, Brianna at one point, the two of them are fighting, but... Jacob has to come over to somewhere he's never been before. And because he suffers from anxiety, she knew that, oh, he's going to want a photo of where he has to park. He's going to want to know who he's going to meet. <laughs> right. You know, just like that type of detail. Um, and she normally tells the story in alternating chapters between the, you know, the two, two main, main characters. characters. Mm -hmm. Yes. And there's always a dog, funny dog. Um, that sounds fun. It kind of reminds me a little bit of Emily Henry, because I'm not typically a romance person, but sometimes I like them, especially if there's funny banter. Yes. I a love lot that. of funny banter. And okay. in this, this instance, it was mainly through their letters. Okay. 
I might have to pick that one up. It says here that Abby Jimenez was the winner of Food Network's yes. Cupcake Wars in 2013. Yes, <laughs> she right. owns, she's like a master businesswoman. She owns Nadia Cakes, which I think oh. is in like Minnesota, but also in California. If there were was a Nadia Cakes here in Rochester, I would be going to get them. Like she talks about them in her books and her TikTok videos. She has Tess the dog running around delivering cupcakes. Yeah. Sweet. Wow. That's pretty multi-talented, <laughs> Who's though. Who's got that energy? I know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty jealous. Yep. But uh, no, I'm definitely going to add that one to my list. Very impressive. Yeah. So my next one is one that has been, you know, Sean, you were talking about kind of rebirth or, yeah. you know, zombie. I said zombieification. Yeah. This one was published in 2017, and it is still going strong with mm -hmm. book clubs and, you know, even a lot of times when I check when people come into the library, it's not here. And that is The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid. Um, I feel like this author is inspired a lot by real people, mm -hmm. and she kind of develops this book around people that exist, but it's not their true story. Mm -hmm. um, she's also the author of Daisy Jones and the Six, which I got very strong Stevie Nicks vibes right. from. And this one, at first I was thinking, okay, Seven Husbands, Hollywood, 1950s. I'm thinking Elizabeth Taylor, you mm -hmm. know. Yep. Um, but she did not have violet eyes and everything. This woman, you know, I think she might have been a little bit of inspiration. Mm -hmm. But Evelyn Hugo, who is now 79, was a Cuban immigrant, very much a bombshell. So it almost kind of sounded like a little bit like... Marilyn Monroe, too, in right. looks with the blonde hair and, you know, tan skin and going through husbands like they're going out of style. Um, <laughs> because romance doesn't work out, Claire. I remember. I, I know. <laughs> More inclined to believe that. Uh, yes, yes. But um, so the premise is Evelyn Hugo is now 79. She's um, announced that she's auctioning off 12 of her most, like, coveted and memorable gowns from her Hollywood career. And... Um, the proceeds are going to go to a breast cancer, like, research, you know, place. But mm -hmm. um, she did have a child, one only one child in all of her marriages, Connor Cameron, and she died of breast cancer when she was only 41 years old. So everyone thinks pretty much that, you know, she's doing it to right. honor her late daughter, who I believe died just like a year before this announcement. Um but anyway, she also contacts Vivant magazine, which I'm thinking, is this Vogue? Vogue. <laughs> <laughs> but, and requests a very little known journalist who was on staff there named Monique Grant to write a feature article about her. So that's the thing. You know that someone this famous would not be requesting a young staff writer. Right. So obviously there's a connection mm -hmm. between Evelyn and Monique. But you have to read almost the entire book to kind of figure out what that is. Um, and I'm not going to drop any spoilers or anything. But um, so anyway, when Evelyn meets with um, Monique, she pretty much throws that premise out the window and says, I really want you here because I'm going to tell you my true life story all about all these husbands, my true love. And you are going to be able to write my biography. It is yours. Yeah. So, so. Some, to drop something like that into an unknown's lap yeah. Yeah, makes you wonder. Oh, yeah. You know something's up. So right away, you know, you realize that. So the chapters are written about the different husbands. And you go from her, how she got to Hollywood with husband number one to her producer that she eventually married and had the child with her friends, and then there's other snippets, they call them like The Spill, like a Hollywood gossip website, or Sub Rosa, which probably was like some scandal sheet at the time. So you get to read like the backstory of some of the Hollywood gossip about her mm -hmm. at the time as well. Um, there's a lot of different themes about what it would be like to be in Hollywood and Hollywood secrets and how that would affect you. I don't want to say too much about that right. because I don't want to spoil the book for anyone who hasn't read it. But um, for me, I think the book was so hyped and I've, I got on this train so late. 
I just had really, really high expectations. And I liked it. It was mm -hmm. entertaining. I kept turning the pages, but I can't say I loved it. Right. You know? I read it, I want to say, several years ago. And I remember enjoying it. But, you know, looking ahead to this podcast, I did not remember a single detail about it. Yeah. Like the characters didn't stick with me while I was reading it. Very enjoyable, entertaining, right? But it it wasn't anything like so unusual that it stuck with me, right? Which doesn't say a whole lot because yeah, I, I read a lot of books and have a hard time remembering them. But some uh, some books do stay with you, right? It's it's not one of those books that made me think a lot afterwards, mm -hmm. which is I'm saving the one that did that, and I that one I really didn't like as much, but I'm still thinking about it, mm -hmm. which is a different way to judge a book, in my opinion, right. you know. Um, so this one, I know it's been popular with book groups. It's, it's had a lot of, I wouldn't be surprised if this one, didn't you kind of feel like it was going to be a screenplay, uh, yes. a movie or, uh, yes. yeah, that wouldn't s well, surprise me at all. Well, it's, it's an rumor has it, yep, yep. it's in pre-pro with Netflix. Oh, yeah, okay. that makes sense. Um, of the two books of hers that I've read, I think I enjoyed Daisy Jones and yeah. the Six more. Um, I definitely enjoyed that one more because to me, that time period resonated with me with the 70s, you know, the music and yeah. Yeah. The soundtrack's fantastic too. Oh, it really is. Yeah. And those people, oh, I yeah, believe, they made it really did the original music for yeah. the most part right yeah they wrote a, like a tune and brought it to life yeah you know and it's it sounds something just so quintessential of that bakersfield sort of sound yeah you know yeah so it's cool did you watch the um the show on amazon i saw a few episodes and then yeah. i got distracted yeah but um yeah, because I actually it. really like the show. Yeah, sometimes you know you read a book and mm -hmm. you know, but I I like the people who they chose. I yeah. felt, you know, and I didn't remember the ending of that show. And then when I saw it, I was just like, wait a minute, is that what happened? Is that? Yeah, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but um, yeah. yeah, it was good. Yeah. yeah. Um, my next book, I've seen, you know, the cover pop up on Book Talk often over the last year or two. Um, it's Crying in H Mart by mm. Michelle Zahner. And I had no idea who Michelle Zahner is, but she is a indie rock star, singer, guitarist for a band called Japanese Breakfast, which maybe I'm showing my age, but I had never heard of them in my entire life. So I came into this book knowing nothing about her, you know, her level of fame. Um, but the, the first line of the book pretty much gives you a good idea. Um, the first line is, ever since my mom died, I cry in H Mart. And H Mart is a, a Korean um, grocery store. And that kind of sums up the whole story it's a, a memoir about her complicated relationship with her mother and um her korean heritage her parents um met in the 80s her father is uh, a caucasian american and he went over to seoul to seoul korea to um sell cars mm -hmm. to the u.s military and uh they joked that the first korean woman he met was her mother who worked oh. in the hotel that he stayed at. They dated for three months and then got married. And a few years later had Michelle who was born in Seoul. And then when she was a year old, the whole family packed up and moved to a small town in Oregon. And the book goes back and forth between her childhood and um, she visited Seoul every other summer for a long period of time each each time to visit her grandmother, her mm -hmm. Korean grandmother, and the descriptions of the food that they ate there and how they bonded over it, you know, just fills the pages. Um, but basically what happened was when Michelle was 25, she was living across the country in Philadelphia trying to pursue music. And it really wasn't going too well. She was cobbling together restaurant jobs to try to survive. She had had a very um, contentious relationship with her mother. Um, Michelle was a depressed teenager. Her mother couldn't understand, you know, why her daughter was pursuing the arts, music, and writing. And so there was a lot of clashes over that. And the stories, um, you know, Michelle 
couldn't understand why her mother, her Korean mother, was so different than her classmates' mothers. She described her classmates' mothers as mommy moms, the type of mother who if you skinned your knee, they'd scoop you up and say, oh, darling, it'll be all right. The type of mother who, even if their kid face was riddled with zits would say things like oh you're always beautiful to me honey <laughs> michelle's mother was not like that she was tough love um she wanted michelle to be the best version of her that she could be and they just often clashed but michelle says that the way her mother did show her love was through food and she would remember you know, did she like extra stew in her sauce? I mean, extra tomatoes in her stew. Did she, you know, what kind of side dishes would she like? And she kept track of all that type of thing. Um, anyways, when she was 25, she got the phone call that her mother was dying of cancer. And so she dropped what she was doing with her music career in Philadelphia and went back to Oregon to help take care of her um, for the remaining months of her life. So it was really a touching book. Um, Sounds like kind of part grief memoir, part yes. food memoir, a yes. little bit, and, and how they intertwine. Definitely. And she realized that, you know, the Korean part of herself really kind of died when her mother did. Mm. Um, and the way she, part of the way that she got through it was by learning how to cook some of those traditional Korean foods, hence crying in H Mart, because you don't, that's what she learned to do okay. afterwards. Um, but I, I enjoyed it, uh, especially with memoirs, a way that I know, you know, did it really resonate with me is if right after I read the book, I get online and see like, well, what is happening with this person? Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to know about her relationship with her father. If they're estranged now, um, she has some not quite nice things to say about her father in this book. And, you know, she's still married to, to the husband, and she is. And um, they're also making, I believe, a movie out of this book. And, oh, wow. Okay. And Japanese Breakfast, her band, is doing the soundtrack for it. Have you ever heard that band? You're yes. I've okay. seen them. Okay. Yep. Yep. Kind of cool. A lot of different sounds. She's got a good voice. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. I have that one sitting on my shelf at home. My daughter read it and really liked it, so I will probably at some point pick that one up. Yeah, no, I definitely enjoyed it. It started, I think, with an essay. Like the first chapter was an essay in, oh, I can't remember what magazine. I think the New Yorker. Um, and, you know, they expanded on it and made it a whole book. Interesting. I do like a good memoir, you know. Yeah. I think memoir is one of the most accessible forms of nonfiction for most people. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So my last one, I think we both have, are the we saved our yes. last books that are by the same author. And mine is her most recent one. It is called Yellow Face by R.F. Quang. And this was really a different book. I can't say I, it, if you need a book with likable characters, mm, this book this is one. not for you. Uh, no, I yeah. remember that main character, and I did not like her. Mm -hmm. Oh, she's just despicable. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of people that I had a lot of issues with in this book. So it's a lot of lies, very dark humor. Um, I don't know if I would say satire, but yeah, it was... Um, so I'll give you the, the basic setup. So we have... Two women that went to Yale, they were kind of friends. Um, both were in writing, June Hayward mm -hmm. and Althina Liu. And Althina, pretty much right out of the gate, she was Chinese-American, and her debut na novel just, boom, right up the charts. Um, June, on the other hand, hers kind of languished, didn't have the same buzz, struggling you know i don't think it ever reached paperback which you right. know she said was a big thing that was one thing i learned a lot reading this book was how the publishing industry works and uh not so sure i liked it but <laughs> yeah and i think that's one of the reasons she wrote this book was to kind of yeah highlight some of the bad things about the publishing industry yes yeah and that was the the most interesting to me so um so anyway they are out one night um i believe celebrating something 
some achievement of Althena. I think she got a TV deal for her most recent book, but she um, tells June that she has written a new manuscript, and she's one of those writers that is very old school. She doesn't share, she doesn't have a digital copy, but you know, she has a, a typed manuscript pretty right. much ready to send to her editor. Well, they are in her house celebrating, and she starts choking, and she chokes to death right in front of June. On a pancake, I think. Yeah. Like, like that part was actually strangely funny. Like, it was so random. Yeah. <laughs> and just the way she describes this, but of course June picks up that type manuscript mm -hmm. before she, you know, leaves after having called the, you know, the police or whatever, who unfortunately did not save Al Althena, but... um. And then decides to publish the book. And then her... She, she did change it, though. The, the whole book, this character is making excuses for why she did what she did. Mm -hmm. Like, she can claim that the book was really hers because she put a lot of work and research into shaping that manuscript. Right. Like, full of justifications and excuses. Yeah. She had an incredible self-ego. Yes. Um, and just you know, different ways that her publisher, because the book was about Chinese laborers that were utilized in World War One mm -hmm. and prejudices and everything that they encountered. So for, for June, I mean, not June, for Althea, it was a subject that she deeply researched, but she was Chinese. Right. Because um, that's another theme that is brought up very strongly in the book is who is entitled to tell someone's story? Like the own stories right. movement was very much mm -hmm. covered in this book. Um, and to make her more palatable, her publisher decides that her middle name was actually, or her name was Juniper. Juniper, yes. Juniper Song. Like her parents sound like they were kind of like hippy dippy ish yes. or whatever. So, but they liked it because it kind of had what they thought was an Asian feel and would be, you know, better market the book with. So, oh, yeah, there was just so yeah. much wrong with this book. Yeah. And when they took the author photo of her, you know, she was a little tanner than she normally might have been. And, yeah, they were really trying to trick the reader into thinking that. Yes, that she was Asian American. Right. So, yeah, and she started... Like, she she was really kind of obsessed with Athea. So she tried to start fitting in, like, giving money to Asian charities and becoming, like, a writer on uh, an emerging Asian-American mm -hmm. writer panel, even though she's not Asian. Yes. She has no Asian blood, people. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was, it was really weird. The only yeah. thing with me... I feel like sometimes I almost feel too stupid to read her books. I don't know what it is. I well, I'll tell you what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I I read, um, I think, an earlier book of hers that really blew up on TikTok, Babel. Um, and oh, yeah. there's, there's a long, you know, Babel or the Necessity of Violence, an arcane history of the Oxford Translators' Revolution. Um, so that's the whole title of it. The reason you might feel a little too um, dumb to read her books <laughs> is the author, R.F. Quang, has a Master of Philosophy in Chinese Studies from Cambridge, a Master's in Contemporary Chinese Studies from Oxford, and she's pursuing a Ph.D. in East, La East Asian Languages and Literatures at Yale. Yeah. And she is... Very impressive. Like, I was amazed when, you know, we both read this Yellow Face book, and I, I didn't know that she was the same author as Babel, mm -hmm. which is a completely different kind of book. Right. It's Yeah, um, I read that one, too. That was one of my daughters and my, like, mother-daughter choice uh -huh. for Book of the Month Club, and that's a, that's a big old chunk of roof, that yeah, one is. Yeah, that's like 560 yeah. pages. It is packed with research um and it's very impressive i'm impressed by her range like she could write a yellow face which was a faster read um which i enjoyed i did really dislike the main character and this very intricate 
nuanced historical dark academia book um which had fantasy elements with to it fantasy as well elements in yeah. it yes and trying to summarize this book I, I couldn't even think of how to do it. I did not go to Cambridge or Yale or Oxford, which I can sense your shock. <laughs> like, really, Molly? You didn't? Um, I looked up Wikipedia to try to get some sense of what, what had I read. Um, but Babel, it's an alternate reality in 1830s England. And Britain's in this alternate reality is still on top. They are, you know... A colonial power, um, but their economic and colonial supremacy are fueled by the use of these magical silver bars. And the bar's power comes from capturing what is lost in translation between words in different languages that have similar but not identical meanings. Like, just the concept is very clever. Definitely not something I have ever read about before. So that kind of magical part was very interesting to me. Um, but these silver bars are, are everywhere in Britain. <clears throat> they can help heal people. They can make the rivers be less polluted. The magical bars can make bullets more accurate. They make their carriages go faster. It really gives Britain an edge up on everyone else in the world. And in order to make this magic, they need language scholars. And those scholars study at Oxford in something called the Royal Institute of Translation. But in the 1830s, in this alternate reality, Britain is having a problem. Their traditional languages, you know, European, French, German, Greece, they're losing their effectiveness. So oh, they're need to be searching for more what to them is exotic languages like Arabic, mm -hmm. Haitian Creole, Chinese. Mandarin. Yes. I am super interested into this because yes. it reminds me of like the specul speculative, like surrealist type tone and like Don DeLillo or uh, Murakami. I think that sounds like something that I would love. And I, I did really like it. Yeah. But it also reminded me that wow, I am not the smartest person in the in the well, world, makes, even in the room. Wonder, like, how much of that were you supposed to sort of understand on its face? Well, she you she know? actually used. I mean, it's a fictional book, but she used footnotes to right. explain different yes. concepts yeah. that she's talking about. Because I read this one as well, yes, and did feel stupid as well on this one. <laughs> but also, you begin to realize that it's not so much about. To me, it wasn't about the language as colonialism yes it may not she, even she be had a, a so point to make yeah yeah yes. um, um and it was pretty tragic in the end too like it wasn't a i like when we picked it up my daughter and i were thinking oh you know an, an academia it sounds like magic silver bars hunting in harry, harry potter, potter world <laughs> you know but that's not what this yeah. is and it does have you know a portion like it's almost like separate books one of the most enjoyable parts of the book, um, you know, it follows a young boy. He's about 12 years old, and he is in China, and everyone in his household and on his street has died of cholera, and all of a sudden this mysterious Englishman comes and helps save him with one of these magical wow. silver bars. Mm -hmm. And that Englishman takes him back to England to get admitted into Oxford. So he spends his teenage years relentlessly studying Mandarin, Greek, Latin, because they need someone with this Mandarin language background, right? Um, someone that can dream in Mandarin. And of course, he was 12 when he was taken away from China um, to help fuel this magic. And there is that kind of Harry Potter element for about 100 pages of the book when he is finally at 18 admitted into Oxford and he meets his fellow students who are also, um, you know, there's a Muslim from India. Right. There's Victoire who's from Haiti. And they create this close bond because they are outcasts there. Right. But the empire needs them. Mm -hmm. But they're not quite accepted. So they have... This sounds heady. Yes. <laughs> yes. And, you know, so there is that aspect of these students are, are bonding and they're eating scones and they're up studying late at night. And 
you're a little more hopeful at that point. But yeah, it's it's really kind of a depressing story because the main character loves his life at Oxford. He loves the studying and all the things he's learning about languages, but realizes that what he is studying and what he is helping is keeping his home country, you know, poverty stricken. Like, right. Yeah. So like that's all like the, the benefits are, are going to Britain, not to anybody else. Yes. So. So it's really dealing with a lot of different issues of colonialism. Mm -hmm. The stuff you learn about language is fascinating. Um, I did really enjoy this book, but it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Yeah. And, you know, reading it, I started looking at it yesterday to try to remember, like, what on earth happened? And I, I did get sucked into it again. Mm -hmm. um, like, I definitely could read it again. It was interesting, that's for sure. Uh, I think you summed it up when I read it. It wasn't what I thought it was. Um, it had some twists in there. It, of course, has like a subplot of, yeah. you know, he's contacted about a counter-revolution type thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I won't go into that too much. Yeah, but there's, there's a few surprises, and um, it's really quite brutal. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it is. And this book, you know, was all over TikTok. Um, you know, I couldn't, couldn't sit and watch TikTok for 20 minutes without, you know, somebody flashing this book cover at me. Um, and that's about as far as Colleen Hoover as you could possibly be. You <laughs> yes. know, it, it's, I would call a very intellectual fantasy. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So... Well, thank you so much, Molly. I think that yeah, we that kind of great. showed that TikTok can have a lot of things for a lot of different people. Um, so, you know, besides listening to us, of course, on Book Break, where we're going to give you some recommendations, mm -hmm. you can find recommendations out there. Um, Instagram is something similar. People tag it Bookstagram or will say how mm -hmm. much, you know, say what they read. So I look there as well. Yeah. But, um, I get a ton of recommendations from Book Talk. My photos in my phone are filled with pictures of my sleeping dogs and then captured screenshots of Book Talkers holding up covers of books. Yeah. That's how I decide what I'm going to read. I'm like, oh, I'm not sure. Let me look through my photos and I'll just see what I captured while I was scrolling through TikTok. Well, good. I definitely am going to use it a little bit more too. Just to, It's nice to feel like get your finger on the pulse type thing. Yes. So. But, well, thank you for joining us, and we will be back in two weeks with another edition of Book Break. Thanks so much. Yeah, it was great being here. Thank you. Book Break is a production of the Greece Public Library, made possible through the support of the friends of the Greece Public Library. Theme music composed and performed by Sean Greif.